Hi, David. My Hello. name is Agnes from Metropolis. Hi, Agnes. David Cadman. I saw you a few years ago. I don't know where, but you... Yeah, yeah. I get <laughs> around. David, how long did they tell you I had? You got 15 minutes. No, Whoa. they told me 30. Well, take 30 then. No, where is Kristen? That's really worrying because I confirmed that with him. Okay, well... Hello! Welcome... This session is Climate Action for Sustainable and Resilient Cities. Just to make sure you're in the right place, Hall B. And let me take a little bit of time while people are still drifting in to introduce our presenters. Uh, the first presenter will be Deborah Roberts, who is the the Sustainable and Resilient City Initiative Unit in the Ithaquini District Municipality of Durban, South Africa, and Manager of the Environment and Planning Protection Development in the city from 94 to 2016. She co-chairs the IPCC's Working Group 2 on the sixth assessment, and she was the lead author of Chapter 8, Urban Affairs, and contributing author to Chapter 12 on Africa, and the IPPC's uh, Working Group 2 Fifth Assessment. And she's a, an advisor to the Global Commission on Adaptation. And because I know her and I told her I would embarrass her, I'm going to. Most of the people who are on the IPC are scientists full time. Not this woman. She has a city job that she does alongside of all the scientific assessment as well. So, She's into reading into the night all the papers that the scientists read just as part of their academic profession. So thank you for your work. Our second speaker will be uh, Kristen Miller. Where is she? Is she in the hall? Good, come on up. She's the director of the EcoCity Builders and has a focus, a strong focus on citizen engagement and a toolbox of strategies and initiatives, including the EcoCity framework and standards, the Encompass curriculum, uh, urban site, and the urban metabolic information systems. And she's on the steering committee of the World Summit, Summit Conference Series. The, we've got two of our uh, panelists who will respond afterwards. Uh, the first one that's up here is Kathy Oak, who is a councillor of the city of Melbourne, first vice president of Ickley Local Government for Sustainability, senior enterprise fellow in Informed Cities, Connected Cities Lab, University of Melbourne, Australia, and Agnes Charlotte Bickard, who's with the World Association of Major Metropolis, senior manager institutional relations in Spain. And the third speaker who we need up here, please, is, oh no, maybe, we, yeah, uh, yeah, Shirim Babu Mahajan, the mayor of Laitipur Metropolitan City, Kathmandu Valley, Nepal. The Eco City Network of, she set up the Eco City Network of Nepal. So, I'm, there's been a bit of a misunderstanding in the, people were told that Certain people had only 15 minutes to speak, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw the rules out here and say to Deborah, take your half hour that you were told about, because that's what you planned for. Then, Kirsten, are you okay with 15 minutes? Okay. And then each of the speakers for five minutes. So we may not get to as many questions here, but this is probably one of the most important presentations you're going to hear. I've been using my Shakespeare to decide to say, to be or not to be. The report that Deborah is going to present to you really puts that in the balance with what we have to do between now and 2030. Huge lifting. So, Deborah, come on up. Right. 
Good afternoon, Vancouver. Yes, you can say hello. I'm a scientist. I won't bite, I promise. Um, as David indicated, there's been some miscommunication. I was told I had 30 minutes, but now I've been told I've got 15. I will try and speed it up, but I do apologize. It's impossible to shorten the presentation with so little forewarning. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the session. It's a particular pleasure to be on the stage with David Cadman, who I've known for many years, and this is the first time we're on the stage in his hometown, so that's a wonderful treat. So what am I going to be speaking to you about today? Well, I'm going to start off this particular presentation with a big question. Why are we all here? And that's less of an existential question than you might imagine. I would wager it's because the majority of people in this room believe that by doing something different in the world's cities, we can fundamentally change the global development path. And I suppose we then have to ask the follow-on question, well, what is that something different? And we've had some cues around that earlier this morning. And again, I would wager that for the majority of those, us, of those of us in this room, we believe that by pursuing eco-cities, so cities that take their cues from the structure and functioning of sustainable and resilient natural ecosystems, we can fundamentally create a different urban future and probably more importantly, a different urban presence. So that's the backbone of what I'll be talking to you about. But why are these natural ecosystems that we want to use as our design templates sustainable and resilient? In many ways, it's because they are infinitely complex. They are fractal in nature. We can see the repetition of patterns at different scales. If we look at our own body, if we look at a tree, a coastline, a mountain range, even in the clouds in the sky. And where does that complexity come from? Well, it comes from the interaction of multiple different parts all interacting together in a complex manner across multiple scales in space and time. And the problem is when these complex systems begin to lose that complexity, they lose the ability to adapt to stress, they become less resilient. And on the screens behind me, you've got a very good example of that, a very practical example. On your left, you can see healthy human bone. You can see it's complex, it's linked together by complex series of microstruts. But on your right, you can see a bone with osteoporosis. That complexity has begun to break down, those microstruts have begun to dissolve, and that bone is now brittle. It's prone to fracture, it's likely to break. And so we see that these systems lose their overall complexity and adaptive capacity as they lose that infinite complexity repeated at many scales. And this is fundamentally what we are doing to the global Earth system. We are reducing its complexity through our human-induced changes in the climate system, in the biosphere, through biodiversity loss, on land, in fresh water systems, in biogeochemical systems, by increasing things like ocean acidification. And by simplifying the world, we are also simplifying the kind of response options that we have available to us to deal with the challenges of the 21st century. And so through our activities, we, like osteoporosis, are reducing the adaptive capacity and the resilience of the global ecosystems that we rely on. So when we think about cities, and bear in mind that cities are now the largest socio-ecological system on the face of the earth. For those of us who are interested in the cities, how can we think about cities that are sufficiently ecologically, environmentally, socially, culturally, economically diverse, that they can aid us in improving the adaptive capacity and resilience of global ecosystems? Well, certainly we've heard today about the ecocity standards, and those provide us with a way of thinking about restructuring and reshaping our cities. They talk to us about four pillars, about design, about biogeophysical conditions, social cultural systems, about ecological imperatives. They allow us to think about cities where we might walk to work, where we might eat local food, where we might participate in local decision making, and where local restoration efforts might contribute to improved global functioning. But I'm here 
not in my uh, role as a local government official that David referred to, but as a scientist working within the context of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And within that role, I've got to ask you another big question. Does climate change pose a significant barrier to achieving the kind of increased resilience and adaptive capacity that we need to see in the world's cities? And certainly there are a growing number of people who believe that climate change poses a real existential threat to us going forward. And certainly we heard Bill Rees this morning uh, raising that very, very topical question. I have to say that when we look at the science, it is very clear. There is no question that climate change poses a significant barrier to achieving a more sustainable urbanization path, to achieving eco-cities. So the real question then is how do we pursue this overall goal? Well, very usefully, we have access to the work by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, who's been around now for over 30 years as part of the UN family, and the job of the IPCC is to provide policymakers and decision makers with an assessment of the scientific and technological literature so they can better understand not only the causes of climate change, but its impacts, and probably most importantly, its responses. And because of the link to the IPCC, we now have access to evidence-based solution options that we can look at and interpret in our own context and determine which of these contexts um, are applicable and which of the solutions make sense in them to deal with the particular challenges of climate change. I want to talk about the special report on 1.5 degrees Celsius. In particular, I've heard this referred to both in the plenary session and the subsequent sessions I attended later on in the morning, because this is the special report produced by the IPCC in October, which speaks directly to the highest level of potential ambition we see in the global policy space. If you read the Paris Agreement, you'll see in Article 2, the commitment to keeping temperatures well below 2 degrees Celsius, but also this aligned level of ambition, which talks to us about also pursuing efforts to limit temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And so I'll be calling out this particular report, but we'll also be talking about two other special reports that we've released during the last couple of weeks, that on land and that on ocean and cryosphere, where these support the findings of the special report on 1.5 degrees Celsius as relates to cities. So what does the report on 1.5 degrees Celsius that you've heard referred to so frequently already tell us? about where we are now. Well, it tells us that since pre-industrial times, and we regard that as being 1850 to 1900, our activities have already caused one degree of global warming. So that's in the bag, climate change can no longer be avoided. And because of that, we are already seeing negative impacts on human communities, natural ecosystems, livelihoods, and economies around the world. At the current rate of emissions, we will reach this higher level of ambition, so the ability to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, somewhere between 2030 and approximately 2050. So we do not have long to act. The important thing, which still gives us a sense of agency, is that past emissions alone do not yet commit us to a temperature increase of 1.5. So we still have the ability to act. We still have the ability to realize a vision of increased ambition in the world's cities around climate change. But what does this ambition look like? The 1.5 degree report gives us some sense of the scale of that ambition. If we're interested in capping global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius with limited or no overshoot, then we have to look at reducing our CO2 emissions at approximately 45% by 2030 and reaching net zero by 2050. Now, the important message behind this is the world does not end in 11 years, despite what you might read in the headlines. What this says is, according to the illustrated pathways we looked at and the scenarios we used, this is the type of ambition that would be appropriate to 1.5. If we do not achieve it by 2030, the world does not end. It does mean, however, that achieving that level of ambition becomes more difficult and more expensive and eventually comes out of our reach. I was born in Africa, I grew up in Africa, I work, I live in Africa, and we're well known for the big five. 
I'm pleased to say that working in the IPCC, we're now being known for the big four. But what does the special report on 1.5 tell us about the kind of changes that are necessary to affect that level of ambition? Well, it talks to us about four big system transitions that are necessary at the global scale if we are to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius with limited or no overshoot. It talks to us about rapid and far-reaching transitions in four systems, energy, land and ecosystems, urban and infrastructure, and industrial systems. So you can see urban is up front as one of the big four systems. And the changes we need to see in those systems are both rapid, they're far-reaching, and they're entirely unprecedented in terms of the scale required. We've never seen anything like it in human history. It's also important because it calls for an all-in solution. Urban is identified as important in and of itself. It's a geography for the changes of the other three systems, but it's important if we're to achieve the level of ambition that is concomitant with achieving a global warming level of 1.5 degrees Celsius, that all cities are in everywhere. No one can be excluded. The 1.5 degree pathways require action in all cities and all urban contexts. So why does the report call out cities as the center of enormous transformation? Well, it's because cities concentrate people and power and money. They concentrate economic activity, social networks, human resources, infrastructural investment. They have relatively nimble local governments. They're still connected to the rural hinterland and the natural systems that support them. And they remain centers of innovation for the human species. But if we're to realize this potential, we need to see very ambitious adaptation and mitigation being affected in the world's cities. And that's because cities are at risk from climate change. If you put so many people, so much economic activity and infrastructure into one place, it's going to be a center of risk. I've just come from New Delhi with its 22 million people, and you can see risk is abundant in cities of that scale. And cities certainly concentrate climate change risk. If you think about heat stress and flooding, the spread of diseases and fire, these are things that will concentrate in the urban context. And these new climate risks will also expose and exacerbate existing risks. So things like poverty, exclusion, governance challenges. And they will do those in the parts of the world where the rates of urbanization are currently highest, Africa and Asia. And I will call out these two continents successively in, during the course of this presentation. So what are some of the risks that cities are exposed to due to climate change? Obviously heat. We know that our cities, because of the materials we use in them, are substantially warmer than their surrounding countrysides. We know that is the urban heat island effect. What the report calls out is that any increase in that urban heat island effect, due to increase in the size of the city or the population in the city, can exacerbate, it can increase the warming in that city by up to 30% with each doubling of CO2 levels. That is further supported by the work in the land report, which again calls out a relationship between the urban heat island effect um, and global warming. And the special report on 1.5 indicates that twice as many megacities are likely to become heat stressed at 1.5 as they are too. And that's an important message, because do not think that 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming is safe. There's still an extremely dangerous level of warming, warming that we have to plan for and create the kind of safety nets that are appropriate to dealing with it. That means exposing more, more than 350 million people to deadly heat by 2050. In terms of flooding and drought, we're going to see cities exposed to both of those extremes. Certainly in flooding, we can anticipate more infrastructural uh, damage as a result of flooding linked to extreme events, linked to sea level rise. We can also anticipate more compound flooding as temperatures increase. And compound flooding is flooding from a number of sources, be that storm surge or flooding from rivers. And we can see the scale of that problem if you think about the fact that approximately 360 million people currently live in urban coastal areas. On the other end of the scale, again, we're going to see more exposure to drought at 1.5, about 350 million people, at 2 degrees, about 410 million. Sea level remains a great challenge for cities around the world, particularly as urbanization continues to literalize. We're building more and more urban development in coastal areas along rivers, and the 1.5 report calls out that at least 136 megacities are at risk from flooding due to sea level rise at temperatures of 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius. 
And that's highlighted in the special report on oceans and cryosphere, which points to the fact that sea level rose 15 centimeters in the last century, but is increasing at twice the rate in the century. At, and at the highest emissions scenarios, we could see a sea level rise of over a meter occurring in this century. Certainly sea level rise also amplifies the effects of storms. It increases the level of coastal water salinization um, that we see in our coastal cities. And for those mega cities, um, the 136 that are currently at risk from sea level rise, without any mitigation, they will have to raise their protective dikes on average by about two meters by 2300. The report also calls out poverty as a key risk we have to think of, and I want to underscore that because I don't think we've heard enough of that in this narrative today. Poverty lies at the heart of all global policy development. Look at the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG 1, look at the Paris Agreement, and remember 1.5 is not a safe level of global warming. It is dangerous. It will still be a poverty multiplier. 1.5 degrees is going to make poor people poorer. The report calls out that, on general, not just in urban areas, we could see 3 to 16 million people being forced into extreme poverty as a result of climate change, with the most severe impacts, again, in the urban areas of Africa and Asia. So these are urban areas we need to be paying particular attention to from a climate change perspective. So how do we respond to these challenges? Obviously, adaptation and mitigation are both important. And I'll call out the links to the EcoCity standards and their four pillars with this icon as I work through the response options identified by the 1.5 report. The report calls out that cities are the front line of our adaptation. This is where we can expect to see our disaster risk reduction um, and management being most significant. This is where we need our early warning systems around droughts and floods. This is where we have the opportunity to improve water use and storage. And I sat in a very interesting session just prior to this looking at water issues in cities. But it also points out that adaptation, which is so critical, is lagging in the very places it's needed in the emerging economies. And this is problematic because they are major centers of population growth, with the majority of that population growth occurring in the small and medium-sized cities. With some of the worst impacts, and again, this notes the fact that 1.5 is not a safe level of global warming for the poor urban dwellers in Africa. So again, that call out on the African continent. But these are economies which face very complex and interrelated um, economic pressures and delivering on things like health, housing, and education. So very hard to figure out how adaptation meaningfully fits into that spectrum. The report also calls out the usefulness of nature-based solutions, of green urban infrastructure, of sustainable water use and management. It highlights green urban infrastructure as a way to increase the resilience of urban areas to the impacts of 1.5 degrees global warming. It points out that in some instances, this could also be cheaper than using conventional infrastructure. And the emphasis in nature-based solutions is again reiterated in the Oceans Report and in the Land Report. It also calls out the usefulness of things like wastewater recycling, stormwater diversion in urban areas as key ways of meeting adaptation mitigation and development needs, but points out there are real challenges. Finance, we've always got a problem with money in cities, but governance problems, because if you're thinking about nature-based solutions, ecology knows no political boundaries. It often extends beyond the jurisdiction you may have, which creates governance challenges for us to deal with. Urban planning and land use are called out in the report as particularly important tools in the context of adaptation and mitigation. Obviously, by planning our city in a different way, we can reduce the level of risk exposure. We can improve overall adaptive capacity. Adaptation plans to things like flooding and sea level rise are very useful. But the report also underscores that literature indicates that we mustn't think about this as a linear process, that we must have a very broad vision when we undertake our planning. We must try and avoid the negative impacts on the poor. So if we have a community along a river which may be subject to increased flooding, one might think the common sense is to move the community away, but we might be moving them away from important social links, from important job opportunities. So this issue of justice and equity and broad participation are underscored in the report. In terms of mitigation, urban economies are called out as being more energy intensive than their national equivalents because of our higher per capita income, consumption, and mobility. And again, that was illustrated in this morning's plenary. 
But this rising demand for electricity can also drive change. For example, the move to rooftop solar. And we also begin to see the decoupling from fossil fuels in the world's cities because of increased use of renewable energy, energy efficiency, and locally managed smart grids. The report also underscores the opportunity afforded to us by price changes. Renewable energy is becoming cheaper. It means we can have more access for people living in cities to clean renewable energy. That has co-benefits. Small-scale distributed energy produced on residential or industrial rooftops allows consumers not only to have access to energy, but also to be producers of energy. Importantly, in informal settlements, the replacement of things like paraffin and charcoal also give us co-benefits in terms of improving air quality, reducing fire dangers, and reducing deforestation. So it increases our overall adaptive capacity and demand for renewable energy. When we think about cities, the first thing you think about buildings, obviously, you can see this when you look at the Vancouver skyline, a really important sector. Buildings consume almost a third of global energy. And again, the report calls out that if we're to work towards that increased level of ambition at 1.5 degrees Celsius, the kind of reduction we would need to see in that sector is 80 to 90 percent by 2050, an enormous uh, and tall order for us to undertake. New construction would have to be fossil-free and near-zero energy by 2020, and that is literally next year. We can obviously achieve a reduction in emissions in our cities through improving embodied energy, so reducing the amount of embodied energy in our construction by using more bio-based building materials, improving overall thermal performance and direct energy use, and we sit in a building which really illustrates what can be done in that regard, and by improving our energy efficiency um, and lighting in terms of our use of appliances and other installations. The report is very strong in underscoring the importance of technology as a catalyst for change, use of data. So it calls out smart technology, so things like the Internet of Things to help us improve efficiency in buildings and the city as a whole, and is indicating that in the global south, some cities are using these technologies to leapfrog their infrastructure and development to low-carbon development straight away. And big data is called out as important in supporting decision-making. Urban transport is probably the next thing you think about after you think about buildings in cities. And again, here we have to see a reduction in energy use by about 15% um, in order to achieve a 1.5 degree goal. That means we've got to change the structure and modus operandi of our system, of our cities. Walkable cities, non-motorized non transport, and shorter commuter distances. Bike share schemes are already showing some lights of change. They're present in 800 cities globally, indicating that thought has been given to this kind of transition. The report underscores that we have to electrify all end use, and transport is no exception to that. We have to see the displacement of fossil fuel vehicles by 2035 to 2050 if we are to achieve the level of ambition required by limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. ICT helps us again with things like car sharing, driverless vehicles, coordinated public transport. And in the part of the world I come from, transport-oriented development is still important because we're seeing an increasing demand for cars on our roads. Overall, we get co-benefits in terms of reduced air pollution, congestion, road traffic fatalities, and improved social cohesion. Again, urban planning and land use is called out as important to mitigation, an important way of reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the transport sector by about 20 to 50 percent as we make our cities more compact. And certainly compact cities make public transport more financially viable. We also see an increase in energy savings as we increase the density in our cities, but where that's counteradaptive is in informal settlements. If we increase density in our informal settlements, we could also increase health challenges. So we have to think about the informal sector as an area of particular challenge where we need to apply new thinking. So thinking about how we upgrade these areas to ensure that we get benefits and reduce the risks. So how do we ensure governance for action? Obviously, urban governance is important, not only in achieving climate goals, but ensuring economic development and equity in all the decisions that we make. Local governments are particularly called out as powerful agents for climate action. And this urban governance is strengthened if we see scenarios where many people are around the table, where national governments support local governments, and where we have subnational networks supporting the work of local governments and sharing best practice. 
But again, the report calls out the problems of informal settlements. Governance is different in the informal sector, and they don't automatically fit into the formal governance systems. And these are things we need to think about as we work particularly in the cities of the global south. And certainly informality was called out as one of the big areas needing research when we look at cities and climate change science. At the Climate Change Science Conference we held in Edmonton, co-sponsored by the IPCC last year. So informality along with things of finance, uncertainty, planning, infrastructure, and sustainable consumption and production are areas where we still need more work. And so the bottom line message from this report is we need an entirely different approach to infrastructure development in the cities of the global south as we build them out over the next three decades. They can look nothing like Vancouver. They can look nothing like London. They look, need to look entirely different if we are to achieve the transitions highlighted in the special report on 1.5 degrees of global warming. And so really what the report sets up is a way of thinking about how we move from global aspiration to local action. Certainly we need science. I've heard everyone refer to the need for science. The IPCC provides that kind of science. We have policy informed by that science in terms of the Paris Agreement and the SDGs. But where we're most lacking is in terms of practice. And I think that's where the EcoCity standards can help us move those aspirational scientific and policy goals into real practice. And hopefully with that, we get the complex, resilient, diverse, and sustainable cities we need to change the global development path. Thanks very much. Kirsten, can I call you up, please? Okay. Or you can sit there if you want. I Thank you, Deborah. I'm going to jump right in. Um, so at EcoCity Builders, we have an adage that you may have already heard a few times so far uh, during this event, as we build, so shall we live. So quality of life for humans and for nature are inextricably linked. We are a part of nature as well as shapers of natural systems and now on a planetary scale, as we've just heard. So the eco-city model gives us a way forward. It's feasible, practical, and doable. Just popping in on some of these sessions, I can assuredly say that if all of us were in charge of the cities, all of us here in this room, we could definitely get it done. <laughs> the knowledge is already here. So the eco-city is right in front of us, but at the same time, it's still miles away. And this is why we gather at events like this, to share our knowledge in order to accelerate ac action and change. We define an eco-city as a human settlement modeled on the self-sustaining, resilient structure and function of natural ecosystems and living organisms. So in natural ecosystems, the more niches that are filled, the more efficiently the system runs, and the richer it is in supporting life. More diversity means more stability because it includes greater numbers of pathways for self-correction when something goes wrong. Similarly, in human settlements, the more niches that are filled, the richer the city is in supporting a vibrant and resilient urban environment. And this was one of the key insights of the urbanist Jane Jacobs. From an eco-city perspective, the key to a healthy urban ecology is to ensure that the forces that shape a city are grounded in environmentally and socially healthy systems, and that the people living in the city are likewise grounded in principles and practices of eco-citizenship. Through this lens of city as ecosystem, we've developed, together with an international advisory committee, and guided by our partners at the British Columbia Institute of Technology, the International EcoCity Framework and Standards, which I know you've been hearing about over the past few days. The framework charts a city, community, or neighborhood steps forward from existing conditions to EcoCity level standards and beyond. The framework is universally applicable and locally adaptable. It allows participants to freely customize and modify practices following local information and experience. 
And to date, under EcoCity Builders Educational Program, Herb Insight, we've tested the standards and methods on the ground with approximately 6,000 users in eight countries. Of course, every city and every situation is different, but what is emerging is that there are several typical defining city trends, and these are extremely generalized, but I thought I would just put them out there. So the first one is the wealthier city with many commendable eco-city aspects, like Vancouver, for example. But where the majority of residents are consuming at the rate of four or five planets worth of resources. Additionally, in these wealthier cities, a rising percentage of residents are being excluded from access to safe and affordable housing and adequate employment, which means that these cities and their populations are becoming more vulnerable and more unstable. Then, there are cities who are still aggressively promoting last century's model of land and resource inefficient fossil fuel and automo-based uh, development that additionally promotes hyper-consumerism and waste. These places are extremely vulnerable to shocks and stresses, as they typically do not have backup systems or redundancies in place. So if one critical supply chain goes down, then there's nothing else to fall back on. Then there are cities where residents are already living close to one planet lifestyles, but they might not live for very long due to unhealthy urban conditions and poor socioeconomic opportunities. This is the kind of urban environment that EcoCity Builders has been the most active in over the past six or seven years. And later in the session, we'll hear from the mayor of Lalitpur, Nepal, where EcoCity Builders is partnering with local organizations, and UN Environment, and the city to launch an EcoCity network led by the city of Lalitpur. We have a lot to learn from Lalitpur because if we all practice sustainable urbanism like the Nuari people of Lalitpur did and are still trying to do, we would all be living safely within Earth's caring capacity in a high quality urban environment. So we've done this before, and so it really means that we can do it again, and we can learn a lot um, from places like Lalitpur. This place uh, where I was living for three months earlier this year, it was an eco city for at least a thousand years. And they protected their biocapacity through advanced urban design and an eco-city governance system. And governance, as we've heard, is so important. It was called Guti, and it still exists today. Um, in Lalitpur, the Nuari people, they're trying to hold on to their sustainable urban traditions while rebuilding after a devastating earthquake in 2015. Protecting their biocapacity is very much of a struggle now. While even as climate change ramps up, neighboring countries are pressuring them to sell off their natural resources, primarily their water and hydropower. But this kind of resource acquisition is not at all unique to Nepal. Productive bioregions and specialized economies all around the world are being sold to the highest bidders. So just because a city is near a productive watershed, they may not legally have access to that water or that energy supply. That's why from an eco-city perspective, it is so important for cities and citizens to understand where their resources are coming from and to be advocates for local and regional policies and localized sustainable development that additionally protects biocapacity. Clearly understanding city systems in this way underpins the work that eco-city builders does today. For a transdisciplinary systems view of what is going on at a city level, one of my favorite EcoCity diagnostic tools is the Urban Metabolic Information System, pioneered by Sebastian Moffat and further developed into a visualization tool with the help of Philip Mansfield. Sebastian and Philip are both British Columbians, by the way. The function of the Urban Metabolic Information System is to illustrate urban resource flows, their directions and quantities. These meta diagrams show complex information in simple and standard ways and are a calculation method for tracking and aggregating resource flows of any type.
for example, water, energy, food, or materials as they flow from nature into the city through buildings and neighborhoods and return back to nature. The diagrams show not only the flow quantities in absolute and relative waves, but also the connections between the flows and the many elements that make up the whole system. It is my favorite tool for eco-city thinking and design. So the process begins by scaling up from a library of reference buildings and select neighborhood archetypes. And by neighborhood archetypes, I mean that each city typically is made up of at least five or six types of neighborhoods. Sample audits of defined reference parcels in the neighborhood are administered. In other words, we get to understand how urban resources are specifically used in each kind of neighborhood, which varies according to building type, location, upstream and downstream sources and sinks, as well as the economic and other demographic makeup of the residents. The reference parcels can then be aggregated, and the result is a neighborhood level urban metabolic information system for that particular reference flow and for that kind of neighborhood. Key performance indicators that benchmark against the EcoCity standards are then collectively developed and clarified using these diagrams, showing the current condition and future desired outcome. From there, a participatory process determines which sort of solutions work best to get to where they want to be. So that is the process with the people living there. But no matter how green a neighborhood gets, eco-cities require eco-citizens or we won't get even close to solving the climate crisis. Each of us wields power to move us collectively closer or farther away through each and every choice and decision we make, including in what we allow our money and our investments to be doing in the name of our financial security. Living within Earth's caring capacity is the main goal of the EcoCity movement and is one of the ecological imperatives under the EcoCity framework. This measure requires us to think globally and act locally as global citizens. It requires us to compare our consumption patterns against Earth's biocapacity, not just the biocapacity of one specific region. This is a very important measure because, as we all know, each one of us is typically consuming products and services that are sourced from all over the planet because we live in a world that is hyper-connected and networked at every level. This is why the research of people like Dr. Jenny Moore and William Reese are so critical. Dr. Moore's EcoCity Footprint tool is now helping cities understand how much they collectively impact Earth's biocapacity, and furthermore, what are the main actions that they can take to close the gap and get closer to one planet measures. So we all know this, but I have to point out again, that it is totally irrational that a species utterly dependent on the natural systems that developed on this unique planet over billions of years has developed an artificial financial system that by design forces it to acquire natural systems, commoditize them, dismantle them, and sell them for parts. Money, our most widely recognized social construct, has a very unfortunate power. It allows for the separation of our intentions and personal values from our agency in the world as expressed by our investments. Let me share an example with you. Our EcoCity eco economics advisor used to be part of a team managing $12 billion in emerging markets equity in a well-respected investment management firm. One day he became curious about how their quantitatively constructed 300 name portfolio achieved such an amazing performance. When he looked at some of the best performing stocks in the portfolio, he found a palm oil company in Malaysia that had destroyed tens of thousands of acres of original rainforest in the Borneo to plant a monocrop of palm oil trees eliminating massive swaths of orangutan habitat in the process. Ironically, part of this company stock performance was predicated on obtaining carbon credits for planting the palm trees that were replacing the original rainforest habitat they'd ripped away. 
And even more ironically, one of his clients invested in the portfolio was a well-known environmental foundation trying to protect the orangutan habitat. So the cognitive dissonance was too loud for him to ignore. He left his glamorous job and began realigning his entire life to align with his values. He's now living as an eco-citizen both in his daily actions and through his investments. And he's teaching others how to become 100% impact investors, individuals who are making sure that their personal investments align with their values. Some organizations, like the investor network Tonic, based in California, are starting to collect data on people like our advisor, who are aligning their personal investments to support the sustainable development goals. Interestingly and hopefully, a high percentage of these investors are putting their capital to work supporting goal 11, make cities sustainable. I'd like to leave you with yet uh, one more proposed geologic term, the Ecozoic Era. This term was coined in 2010 by the late philosopher theologian Thomas Berry. The etymology of Ecozoic is eco, derived from the Greek oikos, meaning house, household, or home, and zoic from zoikos, meaning pertaining to living beings. Thus, ecozoic era is defined as the era of the house of living beings. By using the term ecozoic era, we are being invited to have a personal relationship with the formation of the Anthropocene, the current geologic epoch that dates from the onset of significant human impact on Earth's geology and ecosystems, including anthropogenic climate change. After all, we live in a self-made world while the Earth and the universe are the original sources of creativity, it is we who invent the words, concepts, and the tools. To shape and influence the deep future towards the ecozoic, we need to help each other build eco-cities and the eco-city movement. It's going to be a struggle. There's no getting out of that. But I hope you will agree with me that this is an invigorating, life-affirming struggle. And that through the process, we're all becoming stronger, more focused, and more determined to reach our destination. Thanks. So can I now please call on Mayor Shiri Maharajan from the city of Lalitpur, Nepal. And you can either sit, speak from your chair or come up here if you want. Thank you. Good afternoon to all of you. I represent Lalitpur Metropolitan City. This is one of the oldest city of, one of the oldest cities of Nepal. And this is adjacent to the capital city of Kathmandu. Once I arrived here in uh, Vancouver, I um, really got mad. Wherever I see, everything is beautiful, very nice, very well arranged. Therefore, whatever slides I, pre I uh, prepared in my hometown Kathmandu before I come here, I decided to change a little bit in order to learn what Vancouver has achieved. Because ego city in Nepal, it's almost a new concept. And we haven't done nothing. But however, my city, Lalitpur, is fine art city, and it's a uh, well-planned city, long time back. Every three minutes walking distance, you will find a nice courtyard facing towards the south. And every five, six minutes walking distance, you will find the natural water spouts where we drink water. So this is the smart eco-city of my 
ancient city, Lalitpur. So this is the picture of my city, which has been declared by UNESCO as the World Heritage City. And uh, this city is almost 1,600 years old, but it was very good until early 1950s. Thereafter, a lot of development activities took place. That was taken as rampantly. Therefore, it is gone from bad to worse. Okay, now I have categorized my presentation in three ways. Right after I saw the beautiful Vancouver city. Okay, so here the water management is excellently done. Therefore, I presented my slide starting from the rain god. This is we call Machindranath. And this is we regard as rain god. The, it's the chariot festival. So once we start this chariot festival, then we get rain in the country. So this is one of the ponds, very, very old pond, which was damaged extensively by the devastating earthquake of April 2015, which we repair very recently. And few more ponds, which we have one on the left, already finished. One on the right, its uh, construction is going on. And this one is our future project, which we are going to execute very soon. So in, in Lalitpur, we got at least 20 of this type of big ponds, which are historically very much important. Okay, once we get water in the pond, then this is a picture of natural water spout. Once we get water in the ponds, then this type of natural water spouts get water, which is the main source of potable water of my citizens. And we got 60 of these water spouts, but due to the water table degrading going down, almost more than 75% of these natural water spouts are not working properly. But we get water during monsoon time. So this is one of the challenges that I'm facing being the mayor of Lalitpur Metropolitan City, that I have to revive, if possible, all of those, if not, at least few of those that I'm endeavoring in order to bring those into business. Okay, this is an ancient stone water spout located in the historical Darbar Square of Patan. Okay, now uh, there are so many steps we are working currently in order to make it eco-city. So Lalitpur Metropolitan City in Nepal is the one which has already adopted the building codes. That is why April 2015 earthquake did not damage too much in my city. So next thing is we are constructing bicycle lane. All of you will definitely surprise that this is the first project I'm going to undertake in my country. First time. So we are going to make some uh, bicycle lanes this, this year, which will again be extended to the neighboring municipalities. So again, we are going to have the electrical vehicles in order to replace, in order to start replacing the fossil fuel vehicles. Can I ask you to wrap up, please? Sure. And uh, due to the time constraint, 
I'm going to make it fast. We got a lot of challenges, and uh, this is the, one of the beautiful temples in Nepal. And as you know, Nepal is going to observe Visit Nepal Year 2020. Therefore, I request all of you, if possible, please visit during this time. And we are endeavoring some of the bicycle lane uh, projects, like as already said, and we are constructing some bicycle stands here and there. And we are also uh, putting some uh, uh, garden projects. So this year, we are going to put at least 10 such projects in place. So the future plans are quite big. And uh, we are going to have a small street lights in, in, the, in, in my metropolitan city as well as we plan to ban the plastic bags in the very near future. And in the meantime, we are going to stop, we are going to stop open burnings. So this is, th these are two pictures that, of, that we arranged a bicycle rally in 2019. So there were at least 2,000 participants who took part. So we are trying to encourage bicyclists from nine different angles. And uh, definitely, we planted a lot of trees on the roadsides. So again, these trees are coming up these days very, very nicely. So we are quite satisfied. And one of the projects that we have started is, of course, Kathmandu Valley doesn't have adequate line, adequate public line, but we need greenery. So the best option that I have adopted is to demolish the government premises, big walls outside, so that the pedestrian can see the greenery as well as landscape of that premises. So this is one of the pictures, one of the projects that we already implemented. Okay, thank you very much. This is what we are doing in Lalitpur. Thank you. Kathy O. Uh, thank you, David. Um, I think I've got some slides here and we have, I've got a short amount of time to get through what I'd like to speak to, but I was very glad to host your city colleagues at the City of Melbourne recently, and we've got so much to learn from what you're doing in your city, so I will certainly spend more time with you after, after this session. Um, so I've got a short amount of time, and I really just wanted to emphasise a couple of the points that um, especially our two keynote speakers, Deb and, and Kirsten, have, have already um, mentioned, especially emphasising this need to really better connect policy practice and research if we want to accelerate sustainability in our cities and obviously I come to this with multiple hats and so I've got multiple perspectives not only as a city leader but also um, in, in academia as well and, and when I talk about um, connecting policy practice and research I'm certainly talking a lot more about better connecting the wealth of knowledge and ambition that cities have around climate action but also and this is one representative group of underheard voices but First Nation voices in particular that we need to do a lot better in understanding the wealth of knowledge that come from these communities if we're wanting to actually excel, accelerate change in our cities. And again, I don't have much time, so I wanted to show two examples of what I'm talking about here. Um, when I talk about First Nations knowledge, in Australia, we have the longest living culture anywhere in the world. There's 60,000 years or more of knowledge around sustainability and resilience. <laughs> and yet we, do, and, and I know in Canada, there's 10, 14,000 years of knowledge here. And yet we do very little in understanding genuinely what does that actually mean and incorporating, or not incorporating, but learning from and, and hearing um, with respect to what the decisions that are being made in our cities. 
And again, I have, I have limited time, so what I'm, an example of what I'm talking about here is recently in, in Victoria, in Australia, it was the first time that Woiwurrung language was spoken in the Victorian Parliament in the Willopgin um, Birrung Murrung Act 2017, which essentially was the Yarra River Protection Act. And for the first time, they listened to the Aboriginal, the First Nations people of this area in protecting the whole river. As, uh, as we've heard before, um, nature does not see the boundaries of our municipal, um, our city boundaries, that, um, that the river is a whole system. And the Yarra River Act has um, enshrined that in legislation, is undertaking listening and hearing and putting that knowledge into how we're going to manage the river in the future. And so that is an important example of how we can learn from Aboriginal practice from so many years in how we understand and manage natural systems within our cities. And um, the second example I wanted to show again in my short term is, is leading on from a lot of what Deb was talking about is linking the science that is there to the city leaders and city decision makers a lot better than we do at the moment. And a great example of this is the summary for urban policy makers at the IPCC report, uh, authors um, did recently. This was released at the end of last year. Um, and this was specifically written in a form or in a way that to better understand, so that the science was better um, speaking to uh, decision makers in our cities. And even better is understanding what cities actually need from the science and what is it that they actually want from the research communities. And a very recent report following on from the summary for urban policy makers um, released just last month was this Four Cities by Cities, which was city leaders, city decision makers, um, again, taking the report from the IPCC and making it make sense for the, de the decisions that they're trying to make um, to meet the ambition that cities have around climate action and climate change. And I think that that is really what we must, we as a research community must be doing a lot more of in actually listening to and understanding what cities actually need from the science and from research and collaborating better and, and working together on projects. I see too many research projects um, and, in, and decisions being made for cities without actually talking to cities or working with cities and so that the outcomes are actually relevant on the ground and we need to do a lot better um, with that and the EcoCity standards and the EcoCity um, summit and a lot of the conversations that we're hearing um, over these few days are really showing great examples of what it is that I'm saying we need more of. Agnes, can I call you forward please? Oh, it's backwards, sorry. No, you go the green one. Yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here to today, my first time in Vancouver, an international city with a unique vibe. Vancouverism is an internationally known term that describes a new kind of city living which combines deep respect for nature with a dynamic and sustainable community-oriented urban life and all, at, at all respects. And um, the presentations uh, we have seen this morning uh, illustrated this extensively. So thank you, BCIT, thank you, EcoCity Builders, and thank you, Vancouver. My name is Agnes Bicat, and I work for uh, Metropolis, World Association of the Major Metropolises. Metropolis is a unique global network of metropolises. I was supposed to have a 15 minute presentation, so I hope in five minutes you will cap the essence of Metropolis. Uh, if not, you just go to metropolis.org and I think you will cap it. But now you can relax. You can even uh, close your eyes, but you open your ears. We were established in Paris in 1985. We are politically neutral. We are an intercity network whose mission is to bring together the authorities responsible for managing some of the world's largest and most prominent urban agglomerations. As of today, we count on 100, sorry, 140 member cities and regions from nearly every continent in the world. Asia concentrates almost half of our membership. 
So um, these members are very diverse. We, we have municipalities, uh, metropolitan authorities, provincial governments, capital cities, just to mention a few institutional typologies of metropolitan governance. Our membership is not merely large spaces or large cities of uh, one million inhabitants, but cities beyond their borders. Um, we, in fact, we do not focus on one specific topic. We are more uh, issue agnostic uh, than other groups. We promote a holistic and integrated approach of, uh, to policy making and also to service uh, delivering. Today, more than 1.6 billion people live in these large metropolitan areas, which are expected to account for 40% of the total world population by 2050. Figures are blatant. We have heard about them uh, the whole morning, so I will not come back to them. But what do we exactly mean by this uh, jargon of uh, metropolitan governance? Um, so I'm going to put it in a very simple and visual, visual way. If I live in a city and I commute to another city on a daily basis, who can ensure that I do this safely? Where exactly do cities start and where do they end? As their residents, we routinely require a series of services to thrive. And these needs are the one of millions of people simultaneously. So in a network of urban territories, um, administrative boundaries can become walls that prevent effective management. And to provide services to citizens, it's, it is necessary to coordinate administrations of different levels and dif different sizes accordingly. The many barriers to a sound management of large urban agglomerations, these barriers must be overcome. So we must find creative solutions that guarantee a good quality of life for everyone living the, uh, so sorry, for everyone living in, in, in the major metropolises. And this is what uh, we mean by metropolitan governance. And as a matter of fact, there is not a single model of it. And this is metropolis core business. So metropolis is not going to uh, showcase a, a one solution fit for all, because there is not. We look at different options um, for sound metropolitan governance, and what we do is we, sh we, share, we share these options with you. And Kirsten was asking us a few days ago, so what are the barriers for, to more rapid acceleration and transformation of, of cities? And one aspect of this uh, response from, from a urban or metropolitan perspective would be exactly this diversity and complexity of the layers of the, the urban governance. So yes, Metropolis is this network. We are taking the metropolitan narrative to the international agendas. We are joining the United Nations fora and global conferences, and we support worldwide campaigns. But most importantly, Metropolis is oriented around a dual strategy approach. On the one hand, what I just explained, we are working towards urban diplomacy, advocacy. We raise the voices of the metropolises, lifting them to a global level. But on the other hand, we also foster on the strengthening of capacities for a sound metropolis governance. So when a city becomes a member of metropolis, uh, he, its mayor or its mayoress, I don't know how you call it, um, commits herself or commits himself to comprise and nurture a robust and coherent knowledge sharing hub. And it goes beyond the boundaries of simple data collection because we facilitate a platform where knowledge is exchanged, systemized, and capitalized to its full potential. We sort of act as a huge library, as a, as a resource center, a knowledge hub which disseminates knowledge and also act, acts as a matchmaker and, and connect people between them. Okay, but then you will ask me, how does this actually relate to the subject of uh, today's conference and whether cities can meet the challenges of acceleration, transformation, focus on climate action for sustainable cities? Well, very simply because all these exchanges, uh, systematization, capitalization to, to, that our knowledge hub is processing, these become uh, indicators and facts to nurture a, nar a narrative supporting cities in advancing their actions towards the SDGs. 
So I wanted here, and I wanted to explain more about how we do it and uh, what sort of programs of, of services we can offer to, to cities, but, but I think on metropolis.org will, will respond to this, uh, to this question. But as a conclusion, so Kirsten also asked whether we were hopeful that cities can meet the challenges of, of acceleration and transformation. I think the answer is yes, and we are hopeful, and we, we believe in, in a sharing knowledge and this is again our, our common core business. 600 million new inhabitants are predicted uh, within 10 years. So we must work on urbanization steadily and we, make, we must make sure that we take the right decisions. So if your mayor wants to become part of our endeavors, welcome on board and let's make your city together with us an uplifting presence but also reference worldwide. And I finish encouraging you to have your city apply to our Metropolis Guangzhou Award on Urban Innovation with one or more than one project undertaken by your city. This award is going to take place by October 2020, so within one year, because we will also held our Congress in October 2020. So make, mark your calendar and I look forward to seeing you in one year time. Stay tuned at metropolis.org. Thank you. So on your behalf, I want to thank our five presenters. I want to apologize that we couldn't get to questions, but I think hearing the nature of the presentations, uh, you benefit probably more by that. Uh, there's a refreshment break in the exhibit hall, which is just to your right as you go out, and I've been asked to ask you to participate in the EcoCity Sustainability Trivia on the mobile app. So thank you all for your attendance. My apology that we've gone over time. I think you find it's worth it. Thank you again to our five presenters. <laughs>